yet, but I figured I'd go through kind of what I'm doing and show you the theory behind what I'm doing and the methods I'm doing, so that way if you see me running around the ranch carrying hummingbirds, you know what I'm doing. Um, also, I am attempting to learn how to be a decent photographer, so I tried to use all of my own pictures, uh, unless otherwise noted, so hopefully you enjoy that. Um, and with that, I'll get started. Uh, so, I've had a lot of people help me along the way. Several of them are sitting in this room. Um, but to start, I've had a lot of help at ASU from my lab, my advisor, Kevin McGraw, um, and several other people at ASU. Uh, I've done field work all across this state and some in California. Um, I've done field work uh, at NAU's field station in Flagstaff, uh, at UC Riverside with Chris Clark. Uh, I'd like to thank Linda and Roger and Tony for helping me here. I've also, um, I'm working right now at the Sonoida Patagonia Creek Preserve, so I'd like to thank Luke Reese over there, and then a few other places um, throughout the state and other people that have helped me. And then finally, I've been funded by several agencies, including the Animal Behavior Society and the Society for Integrative Comparative Biology, without whose help I wouldn't be able to do what I do, so, um, yeah. Uh, so I'm interested in animal coloration. And uh, as you can hopefully see from these pictures, um, there's a huge diversity of coloration in the natural world. Uh, from insects to birds to uh, reptiles and amphibians, you see all colors in the rainbow. Um, and all these colors are produced in different ways. So we see lots of colorful birds, especially reds. Um, you see some greens too, and then um, a lot of browns. Brown is still a color. It might not be an exciting color, but it's still a color. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you have some really pretty um, reptiles and amphibians like the Gila monster here or the tree frog in Panama. Um, and so, you know, this is just kind of show you the diversity of coloration. And a lot of times what this color is used for is it's used to communicate uh, either within a species, so one bird communicating to another, or across species. Um, like some animals will communicate, I'm toxic to other animals so that they don't get eaten. Um, so these are called signals, and the kind of basic framework of an animal signal is you have, for instance, this turkey who um, is sending off something, uh, a sound or showing off a color, through the environment, let's say Ranchi Canyon, where I took this picture, and then it's picked up by a receiver, uh, in this case a female. And then that uh, signal conveys some sort of information to the receiver, which then can make a decision based on that. So in this case, this female could decide, based on the male's uh, visual and auditory traits, whether or not she wants to mate with him. And so that's kind of the general framework I'm, I'm talking about when I'm talking about signals. Now, something that's interesting about animals is a lot of times they have multiple signals. They communicate in multiple ways. So for instance, colorful birds that sing, uh, colorful insects that produce a lot of odors, um, and then frogs, which also make a lot of acoustic noise. And so this raises some questions of, of why did multiple signals evolve, and why is there so much variation in these signals? Because signals are often costly. Uh, if you're a really bright, colorful bird, it's kind of hard to hide from a predator. Or if you're giving off some pheromones, you're having to make those pheromones and then give them off. Um, and so a lot of these signals are very costly, so why would you have more than one uh, and, and just take on more of those costs instead of just having a single signal? Well. Um, there's been some previous work on this, and it's focused on three main areas, which I'll go into one by one. The first is um, the reason we have multiple signals, or animals have multiple signals, is because they need to convey multiple messages. So let's go back to our turkey. Let's say that uh, when he makes his acoustic sound, it's to attract females, whereas its visual traits, puffing up and showing off all its feathers, that's actually to fight off rivals. So it's using two different signals to do two different things. One is to attract mates, and then one is to fight off uh, rival males. Alternatively, you could have what's called redundant signals, where every signal is for the same purpose. So if we go back to the turkey, maybe both the uh, audio and visual traits are just to attract females. That way, if she maybe doesn't hear him, she can still see him, or vice versa. Um, 
to kind of go off of that redundant messages idea, um, there's this new idea uh, about environmental variability driving multiple signal evolution. Uh, so what I mean by that is if we have this turkey trying to communicate in a really dark forest like this picture, uh, maybe the female won't be able to see him at all just because it's too dark, but she can still hear him. So that way this signal is kind of a back, one of the signals is a backup to the other. Uh, alternatively, if uh, say this male is trying to communicate in a really loud area with a lot of these spotted toadies singing or something like that, um, then she can still see him even if she can't hear him. So fluctuations in the environment can kind of uh, drive the need to have multiple signals so that regardless of what's happening, something is transmitted through the environment for the receivers to pick up on. Now what I'm studying is uh, how signals might have interacted as they evolved and how that might have driven uh, further evolution of these signals. Um, because you could have two signals that work together to produce a super signal, or two signals that work together to amplify one of the other. Uh, but not a lot of work has been done on this, and so that's where I'm trying to fill in the gap in this literature. And so two kind of brief examples of some signal interactions that have been stated but not necessarily studied uh, have been found in scalopers, lizards, and trogons. Um, both of these animals uh, typically are, are harder to find, uh, even though the trogon might be bright red. You typically don't see it like that. They usually keep their back turned uh, so that you just see a green back. And what both of these animals do is when they want to display their color, they have to use some kind of behavioral mechanism to show that off. The lizards will do push-up displays, and then you can see the bright coloration on their throat and their belly. And the, um, the trogons will actually lift up their rumps, and then you can see the, uh, the red color from behind. And so both of those animals are having behaviors that interact with the colors to produce a signal. So you have two traits producing the single kind of signal. And that's what I'm trying to look at uh, for my dissertation, is what, are, what, what, happened, what happens with that and how did that evolve. And to do that, I'm studying iridescent coloration, which is a type of coloration that's um, angle dependent and will be demonstrated by this hummingbird. So you can see as the hummingbird's moving, the color is changing. And that's because iridescent coloration is uh, angle dependent both on where the receiver is, so how we're looking at it, and where the light source is coming from, so in this case where the sun is. And as he moves, his color changes. Uh, and so you can see how this kind of color can have great uh, interaction potential with different behaviors, because as the animal does some kind of display, some dance, um, that can greatly change what their color looks like. So I'm doing my work in hummingbirds. Um, now you might ask why hummingbirds. They're, they can be kind of difficult to work with. They're really small. Um, they can be hard to catch. Uh, but there's a lot of pros to working with hummingbirds. Um, like I already mentioned, they have iridescent coloration. So here you can see a coastless hummingbird. Um, one where you look at it face on and it's that really bright purple, and then if you look at it from the side it becomes black. Um, they also have a lot of exaggerated display behaviors, and I have another video. And I'll play this one a couple times because it's really kind of interesting to watch. So this is what's called a shuttle display, where a male kind of hovers back and forth in front of the female trying to get her to mate with him. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so what you can see during this video is that the male's actually showing off his color as he's doing this crazy sprint display. Um, and so that's kind of why I'm interested in this, this display behavior and why I'm looking at these signal interactions, because this display is working with the color to kind of produce this really exaggerated display. So, uh, and then the third reason I want to study hummingbirds is because they're diverse across North America. Um, so you can see all these species here, you might recognize several of them, several of them uh, from the southwest, but these are all hummingbirds that are part of a group called the bee tribe. Um, they're called that because they tend to make a noise when they fly or when they display that sounds like a buzzing bee. Um, and so I'm studying the, the evolution of the display I showed you uh, in that video and the color um, in this group. 
And so, um, like I was trying to show you in the uh, video, this is what hummingbirds look like when they display. They kind of transform from something like these into this, or you can kind of see, so here's the bill, and then this is the male's uh, head and throat. It splays it out and kind of becomes like this really amazing uh, showcase of, of color. And so that's what I'm looking at. So this is a calliope hummingbird here. That's a high elevation species in the upper Rockies. And then this is a Costa's hummingbird, uh, which is a desert species, common here in California. And so this is where I'm studying all the birds. Uh, I've already done work in Flagstaff. I'm uh, conducting work here on black shin. Flagstaff was broad-tailed. I did some work in the deserts of California on uh, costas. And then next year, I'll get to travel to Lake Tahoe to study calliope. Um, this is what I love about my job, is I get to go to all these really awesome places and study calliope. Uh, and they pay me for it, so that's great. Um, so now I'm going to show you uh, how I normally look at these shuttle displays. And that's from directly below, so that way I can kind of trace the path of them. And so I'm going to show you two species. The first is the broad tail, and then I'll show you a costas. And you can look at how different the two species displays are. So this is the broad tail. And so he's, he's shuttling back and forth to a female that I have in a cage which is why I have the females in the barn. <laughs> yeah, that, so that tracking behavior will be important later on. I'll play it again. So you have both the male shuttling and the female following him the whole time. <laughs> All right, and now here's the costas, which is going to look a little different. So you already saw this from one angle, but now this is from below. And so you can see that the Costa's males barely move, they kind of just hover one spot. And which makes it easier on the female, because she can just look straight. <laughs> she doesn't give herself whiplash or anything. Um, so yeah, these are the, the two different displays of the species. But she still is following him, because he will move eventually, and she'll follow him through the whole thing. Um, and throughout these, they're also making a lot of noises. Um, the costas are actually singing while they're doing this. Uh, and then the broad tail, they make a lot of mechanical noises with their wings. Um, if you want to hear that, I have my laptop and I can play it for you later. Um, but yeah, so again, uh, shuttle displays with females watching them carefully. And then uh, I don't have a video of it yet um, that is prepared like this, but the black chin hummingbirds. They have a display that's a lot wider, so their display is probably about this wide, which actually makes it really hard to get on a single camera. Um, so I'm working on that problem. But, um, and this is an example of what I can do uh, with the video. I can track the male as he's moving, with the female as the center point. And then you can see right here, he's just kind of gone back and forth consistently. The displays are very consistent in that they try to keep every like segment of the shuttle the same. And then from there, what I'm doing is I'm trying to recreate the displays in the wild, um, which I'll get into later, and then see what the female is actually seeing, like those two pictures I showed earlier with the male's gorget all splayed out. So what am I measuring uh, to, to do this? First, I'm measuring the male position around the female. So I do a circular cage so that he can choose in a 360 degree uh, area where to display. And I try to see how that is influencing what he looks like. I'm also looking at male orientation. So is he directly facing the female, or is he like slightly turned? Because of the way his iridescent color works, that will greatly alter <coughs> what he looks like to the female. Is he going to be bright pink, or is he going to be black? And then uh, I'm tracking female behavior to see how, that, uh, how male displays are related to that. Does she prefer something about some males versus others, and how does that show up in the tracking behavior? So this is kind of like the female choice side of things. So to catch males, <clears throat> I either use traps on feeders like this, or if that doesn't work because rufous hummingbirds are migrating through, um, I'll set up really complicated mist net setups that take about an hour to set up. So I, I really prefer to use this method. Um, but when I was in Flagstaff, rufous hummingbirds were actually kicking broad-tailed hummingbirds off of their territories and preventing me from catching them. So that was fun. <laughs> um, and then once I have them in hand, I take a variety of measurements, including bill length and mass and things like that. But I also pluck a few feathers from their colorful throat. 
Uh, just a couple, they're, they're fine. Uh, and then I use those, uh, I mount them on, on some cardstock and then run them through the displays that I filmed and see what the female is actually seeing using some objective ways to measure color, uh, which I won't get into for this talk. And in addition to all of that, I'm also measuring things about the environment. So I'm measuring uh, where the sun is, because the sun is the main source of light for these. Uh, and so that will greatly change what they look like. And I'm measuring the background that they display against. Is it going to be blue sky? Is it going to be mountains? Is it going to be foliage? Because then uh, that will change how easily the male is seen by the female. Um, and so you might ask why I'm doing this on four different species instead of just the one. Um, and that's because I'm trying to look at how differences in their plumage morphology and the shapes of their display kind of evolve together. Um, I, my hypothesis is that these traits co-evolved to kind of match each other. Uh, and what I've found so far fits that. Um, so of the four species, just based on some casual observations, black chains, which have the smallest uh, color patch, also have the widest displays. Broad-tailed have a slightly larger color patch and a slightly narrower display. Calliope have an even more large and complex color patch with almost no movement. And Encosas have the largest color patch, but they barely move at all when they shovel. So it seems like there's some kind of uh, evolutionary relationship here where as you have more complex and larger plumage, you have less complex displays. And this could be due to the fact that as these costas are moving, if they move too much, that might make their color kind of disappear uh, and turn black. Whereas these black chin, sometimes you can't even tell that they're purple, they just all look black. So maybe they can have these really wide displays and not have to worry about um, their color as much. Uh, so that, those, these are some of my preliminary results, and I'm hoping that as I look at male orientation and positioning in the environment, that'll help further show uh, what's going on in this relationship here. And with that, I'll take any questions. And this is not Photoshop, this actually landed on my finger. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it has to be uh, the female themselves, and then also a lot of these birds will have special feathers um, on their body that help them orient based on wind speed and things like that. So they could be using um, really fine-tuned measures like that when they're flying. Can any of them with their eyes, own eyes, see? I mean, especially if they are Probably doing these, not. these things where the feathers are actually coming out, can they actually see their feathers? Well. That's an interesting question. Like maybe the costas could because their feathers go so far. With the, with broad tail and black chick, probably not. Um, but that's that's an interesting point. This this idea of self perception in, in the animal communication world is a it's a new idea that's kind of unexplored. So it's interesting. Uh, do you know anything about the energetics? The difference in the amount of energy expended in the different shuttle paths? Or? Yeah. So. Um, Actually, most of the work that's been done on hummingbirds has been in their flight and their energetics because they fly so differently than every other bird. Um, and it seems like when they shuttle, uh, it's, I mean, generally across hummingbirds, it's like us running sprints. But I don't think anyone's actually compared across the species how each shuttle might be different. So that would be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, well. I mean, you can envision that it's, it's energetically worth building a fancier feather than spending a bunch of energy flying right. around. Is it possible that young males can learn through displays by watching older, experienced males the same species? I think that is possible and does happen. I have seen young males practicing. Um, sometimes, so they, in addition to, <laughs> to uh, shuttle displays, uh, males also do this thing called a dive, where they fly up really, really yeah, high yeah. and they dive down. And um, I've seen the juveniles like a group of juveniles together practicing this. Where one guy, guy goes up, dives down, and then perches, and then the next guy goes up, dives, and kind of practices together. So yeah, I think they could be learning from older males and learning from each other. Remind me who's funding this research? Who's funding? Uh -huh. um, so I have funding from the Animal Behavior Society, the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology, um, Sigma Xi, which is like a, an honors, um, 
Greek society, and then uh, Miami University has funded in several ways. Uh, this sort of this sort of research, mm -hmm. um, what's up? Because it's totally you know, new to me, and I don't know much about. Uh, why is why are those organizations funding it? I mean, it's really interesting and all that. But is there an end goal that's bigger than just like this project? So uh, a lot of this is uh, basic science work, um, which is why I'm doing it. It's kind of a selfish uh, interest. And, um, and these societies uh, kind of just perpetuate further science and understanding the world we live in. And so that's kind of my uh, overall goal, is just to understand more about the world we live in, especially since uh, so much of it is disappearing. Mm -hmm. But um, a bigger thing that could be taken from this is learning about how the environment and how um, like specifically these males display to each other and court females could potentially be <coughs> with conservation efforts because if we find out that males uh, are only successful under certain conditions, we need to make sure that they have those conditions in the wild or else they might not copulate as much and they might not <coughs> produce as much. So it can have some conservation. Do they do the shuttle behaviors at a certain time of day when the sun angles a certain, or do they do they change where they do the shuttle behavior as the sun moves through the? So that's what I I think might be happening. I've seen them display all throughout the day, but I think they might be adjusting themselves as the sun moves so that they're getting that kind of maximum brightness. Yeah. All right. Thanks. thanks.